evening, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Luke 2, as we continue to explore history from eternity to eternity, especially God's story, we come now to this narrative from the life of Christ, recorded for us only by Luke. Chapter 2, we pick up the reading in verse 41, and we will read through the end of the chapter. Luke 2, beginning in verse 41, hear now the word of the true and living God. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was twelve years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Let us pray. Father God, bless the reading of Your Word. Bless us as we study Your Word this evening. And help us to see our Lord when He was but a boy and the significance that it has for us even today. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Very little is known about the life of Christ from the age of two until He is about 30 years old when He begins His ministry. Luke tells us He's about 30 when He does that in Luke 3, verse 23. Now, as a result, there were several documents that emerged in church history purporting to shed additional light on these obscure early years. For example, a late 2nd century A.D. Syrian document called the Infancy Gospel of Thomas tells several a historical miraculous stories and sayings of Jesus' infancy and boyhood. Just so you get a flavor of it. You can find it readily online. Just search Infancy Gospel of Thomas. There's a, another document called Pseudo Matthew that has a lot of the same information. Again, all of these written well after the first century. But uh, the events include the boy Jesus makes 12 clay pigeons by a river on the Sabbath. And the boy Jesus is confronted for he's profaning the Sabbath and he claps his hands, says, off you go. And those clay pigeons become real pigeons and they just fly off, right? And he had also collected some pools of water in this same uh, day and a son of Annas the scribe in Pseudo Matthew, he's called a son of the devil. That son of Annas lets the water go. And Jesus, the boy Jesus, he is infuriated by this. He curses his playmate and he says, You will be dried up. And straightway, that boy was quite dried up. You get a flavor of this, right? This this is like uh, this is like uh, the, the old Twilight Zone episode. It's a good life, and and the the whole world is terrorized by this little boy, right? You're a bad boy. You're a very bad. Send him out into the cornfield, Billy. You know, <laughs> that's the Jesus of these documents. Um, one boy bumps the boy Jesus on the shoulder and. 
uh, that Jesus strikes that little boy down. Well, the, the parents of that boy, as well as the parents of the son uh, the, uh, that was dried up, they confront Mary and Joseph about this. And uh, Joseph goes, uh, he's told, you know, Joseph, teach this boy some manners. And, you know, teach him to bless and not curse. And so Joseph confronts boy Jesus, and Jesus gets angry with Joseph and essentially says, buzz off, Dad! Right? That, that's, that's the Jesus of these extra-biblical documents. Um, the boy Jesus heals a man who accidentally cut off his own foot with an axe. Uh, Joseph, who's a carpenter, cuts a board too short and the boy Jesus lengthens the board miraculously for him so he can continue building whatever he was building. He heals his half-brother James of a snake bite. The, the, the miracles are just multiplied, including a number of resurrections that also include people that the boy Jesus had cursed and struck down and killed himself. Clearly, there was a fascination with these early, obscure years of Jesus. What was He doing all that time? And it was true then, it's true now. People want to know about what was He like as a small boy? What was He like as a, a lad? As a preteen? As a teen? What was He like as a young man prior to His ministry? And even now, there are those who hypothesize that Jesus, in His 20s, made a trek East, even from the ancient Near East, over into, say, like China. And that's where he got a lot of his wisdom. The problem with all of this, of course, is that it's mere speculation. It's fiction at the end of it. People made it up back then, and people are making this stuff up today because, well, all the world loves a story. The reality is, the only infallible record of Jesus' life is Scripture. And... Quite frankly, it offers scant details of what Jesus was like as a boy. In fact, Luke is the only one who offers uh, any extended account of Jesus between His birth and when He begins His ministry. And even then, at most, it's 30 verses. That's it. And all we really have to, to go on is, as far as Jesus as a, a young boy, 12 years of age, is Luke 2, 41 through 42. And the reality is, if, if more were necessary, the good Lord would have seen fit and would have seen to it that it be revealed. If that it's not revealed, we don't need to know. But here again is this account with Jesus going up to the temple with his parents when he's 10 years old. And hopefully, immediately, just based on the brief descriptions I've given you, from these apocryphal and <clears throat> pseudepigraphal works, the contrast is stark. It stands out in bold contrast here. Uh, Luke's historical narrative and these other ahistorical. The, uh, these, these other documents typically are, are very Gnostic uh, in their overtones and are, well, they're, they're not even based in, in history. For example, <laughs> one of the accounts and both the infancy gospel of Thomas and pseudo-Matthew record it, Jesus is being instructed in his letters. Right? He's learning the alphabet. Now, Jesus was a young Jewish boy, right? So you would expect him to learn Hebrew. He spoke Aramaic. You have a couple few phrases of his in the gospels that Talitha Kumi, that's an Aramaic uh, phrase. And, and yet, Jesus' teacher is teaching him the Greek alphabet. And so he's, the teacher says the first letter is Alpha. And you, Alpha, Jesus, the boy Jesus is supposed to have said. And then, well, the next letter uh, is, is Beta. And, and what, uh, so first of all, you have that poor historical accuracy, not even close. Second, what ends up happening is Jesus begins to instruct his instructor. And it has this very Gnostic ring to it where he's like, oh, would you teach me Alpha and I have to teach you Beta? And uh, what the Gnostics would do, and we know about this because the apologist Irenaeus in the late 2nd century was having to fight this stuff off. What they were saying is, ah, you see, here is the boy Jesus teaching us about the unknown and how it is the unknown is al Alpha. Right? 
And, and Irenaeus comes on the scene and says, you see how they're just making this stuff up? This is ridiculous, right? This is not even close. Luke here, very sober. Very sober accounting of the historical record. And it has all the hallmarks of uh, a very restrained historian, which is what we expect from Luke because that's how he begins his gospel. He's given careful consideration and investigation into the matters, going to the eyewitnesses themselves. My own personal conviction is that this account probably came from Mary herself. Uh, we're told there in verse 40, uh, excuse me, 51, that his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And so it seems as though now, years down the line, Luke has come to Mary and now she is opening her heart to him and saying, here's, here's something that happened. And again, it's... Um, you know, Jesus, the boy Jesus isn't zapping anyone dead, okay? Uh, he's not, you know, crafting animals out of clay that then become real animals that they can now sacrifice in the temple. Nothing like that. Now, nothing outrageous or fantastic. It's just, uh, well, the marvel is much more subtle. Because the people who hear him, they're amazed, not at these fantastic works. They're amazed at his understanding. They're amazed at his his grasp of the Torah, the law. They're impressed by His wisdom at such a young age. They are impressed with His nearness to God. Now, that's so evident in this young boy. That's what they're impressed by. They're impressed by His relationship to His Father in heaven. And all of this is very subtly hinted at by Luke. It's not, you know, spelled out in kind of a grotesque caricature. Uh, the account, it ends with a mild rebuke from Mary. And Jesus doesn't respond like these, uh, you know, extra biblical writings where, ah, buzz off, Mary, right? He's, he's very respectful and he says, why, why were you looking for me? I, didn't you know I would be about my father's things? Literally what it says there. And then it ends also not only with that gentle response to his mother, but then it also ends in his submission to them. Uh, and, and he does. He goes back to Nazareth with them in verse 51 and was submissive. In other words, he lived in obedience to the law because the law says, honor your father and your mother, which is what the boy Jesus did. Well, let's dig in a bit further, shall we? The, the verse 41 begins with uh, the account how Every year, Jesus' parents went to the capital of the Jewish world, which is Jerusalem. That's where the temple was, the very presence of God. And it, It's not certain if uh, Jesus, prior to this, if He'd been going with them. Now we know, eight days after He's born, He's presented in the temple. That's what, would, what was required by the law. Uh, and uh, uh, also, uh, the purification that takes place earlier in Luke chapter 2, when He's presented at the temple then, and all of this, again, in keeping with the law of Moses. Mary and Joseph, devout uh, in their uh, observance of the law. But did Jesus go up? It's very interesting that Luke emphasizes that his parents went to Jerusalem every year, which seems to identify that maybe Jesus didn't. This is his first trip, in other words, back to the temple since he was born. Uh, and, and so now the emphasis is on how they, when he was 12 years old, they, verse 42, went up according to the custom. And so, again, it, it wasn't required. The, the custom in the day was uh, you didn't become a son of the law, a son of Torah, until you were 12 years old. And uh, so that, that may be the custom that's being identified here, and the emphasis is now on how they, as a family, went up together. Um, if he had gone with them, again, we, we don't, it's not certain if he did or didn't, but if he did, he probably knew what was going on. He'd seen the, the teachers, the, the doctors, the old King James says, uh, on these previous excursions. And he knew that once all the festivities were done, those guys, they'd, they'd get together and, and they would engage in their disputations. And, and no doubt, again, if he'd gone up before, he knew about the Passover lamb. And how, again, this, this, the, that's the feast that's emphasized here is the Passover. 
He was a young boy. He had smelled the smoke and seen the blood. and Maybe all that had made an impression upon Jesus growing up. This account, though, does indicate whether He went up with them prior to this or not, He had some conscious knowledge of His own destiny. That something great, but also something very grave, uh, was yet future for Him. He's 12 years old. They go up. The, the feast would have taken seven days. And at the end of the seven days, by the way, that's Exodus 13, verse 6, tells us it was a seven-day feast uh, festival. After that's all done, they go home. And, and Mary and Joseph, uh, they're, they're going back home. Unbeknownst to them, the boy Jesus has remained in Jerusalem. The way they would have traveled, it was with a caravan of people. Uh, we see here that they were going with, at the end of verse 44, their relatives and acquaintances. So it's a bit of a caravan here. And usually how it went was uh, the women went ahead of the men, and the women with the small children went uh, in, the, in the front, and then the men came up behind with the, the older uh, children, uh, the, the older boys, uh, in fact. And so, I don't, no need to assume here, Mary and Joseph are negligent parents, okay? They, uh, no doubt, loving parents, but it seems like Joseph assumed, oh, he's with Mary, and Mary assumed, oh, he's with Joseph. They go to day's journey away. They start searching among the party. Where's Jesus? Well, I thought He was with you. No, He's not. I thought He was with you. No. And so they're, they're looking around trying to find Him. He's not there with the group. And now, we've got to go back. And those of you who've been parents for any amount of time, you know kids will scare you to death, right? You've got to imagine that was a sleepless night. And, and no doubt before the sun was up, Mary and Joseph had their stuff all packed and ready to go to make the trek back, the day's journey back to Jerusalem. And then even then, they got to... You seen, have you seen this? Our, our little boy's missing. He was here. And, uh, you know, sleepless nights. Probably, you know, at that point, your stomach's all tied up in knots, not eating, right? Just kind of strung out. And... and uh, they finally find Jesus after three days. And again, what was typical after the feast, after the Passover, you get these teachers who'd get together and, and they'd have their disputation groups. Maybe it was akin to our small groups. I don't know. They'd gather around the Word and they would discuss. And it was a question-answer format. And, and that is where they find Jesus. They find Jesus right in the middle of the temple, right in the middle of a group, and He's being asked, and He's answering, and He's asking questions Himself. And we are told there, in the emphasis here in verse 46, excuse me, 47, is that all who heard Him were amazed. Their jaws just hit the floor. Wow! They're amazed at His understanding and His answers. Even, uh, no doubt, all who heard Him included those teachers. Those guys who were experts in the law. They're going away going, wow, this kid really knows his stuff. Where did he get this wisdom, right? And so Mary uh, sees this going on. Mary and Joseph, his parents saw Him. They're amazed. They're astonished at what's going on. And it's Mary who comes up and says to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I, we've been searching for you in great distress. Not just distress, but great distress. Right? There's the emphasis there. And uh, notice the contrast here. Mary says, Your father and I have been searching for you. Your... But then notice how Jesus answers. He says, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be about my Father's house. I must be in my Father's uh, in my Father's things, in my Father's affairs. It, again, is literally what it says there. Your Father, but then He says, my Father. That's the contrast here uh, that Jesus is presenting. And also, again, this seems to be the first appearance of Jesus' own conscious awareness of His own identity, who He is. That He is the Son of the Father. 
He's God's Son. And what is especially noteworthy is these are the first words of Jesus that Luke records. And the first statement that's found on the lips of our Lord by Luke is an indirect statement of His own identity as the Son of the Father. Kind of like the disciples later on in Luke. Jesus' parents, verse 50, they, they didn't understand this. Just right over their head. Uh, they, they didn't catch it. and understand all the implications of that very pregnant statement from the boy Jesus here. But again, it is a, an affirmation by Jesus of His own unique identity as Son of the Father. One uh, writer put it this way, Jesus so clearly refers to His divine Sonship and He points to His life's vocation to be about His Father's business. These words indicate a divine inevitability. Jesus must be busy with the interests of His Father. And how much He knew, all the... Uh, all that he knew about his divine position and calling, it's not entirely certain here. I mean, we're told that he grew, he increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. So apparently there was room for growth. But again, it would appear he has some knowledge of who he is and his divine assignment. And once this uh, traumatic event is uh, over. Jesus and His parents, they head back to Nazareth, verse 51, and again, He was submissive to them. Uh, no, none of the, you know, what, what eventually develops through uh, apparently a Gnostic strain with all the, the writings that came later where you have Jesus, you know, He knows better than His parents and all that. Um, you know, the kind of the, even the horror movie Jesus where He's, you know, zapping people dead and all that. Nothing like that. He's submissive. Honor your father and mother. And he lives in accordance with the law. And then uh, he's obedient to them. His mother, Mary, she treasured up all these things in her heart. And Luke summarizes 18 years of Jesus' life in a single verse. Verse 52. And he just says, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature, in favor with God and man. What is remarkable is the way Luke designs his narrative as a clear echo of uh, 1 Samuel uh, and also uh, 2 Samuel as well. Earlier, uh, we saw in what is called the Magnificat back in Luke chapter 1, the, the song that Mary sings, verses 46 to uh, 55. Now there are these, these clear connections back to the Old Testament, one after the other, and how there is a parallel between Mary and Hannah. Uh, Hannah, the, the mother of Samuel, who herself, uh, through divine intervention, has a son. And now here is Mary with an even greater divine intervention as a virgin, uh, giving birth to the Son of the Most High. Mary treasures all these things up and it seems like in the back of Luke's mind is again that Hannah story. A clear echo of say 1 Samuel 2 in verse 26. Jesus goes back to Nazareth and again, after this there's that 18 years of silence. We don't know any more about what happens uh, in in Jesus' life. We can uh, make some deductions based on what is said about Him later on. We, he's identified as the carpenter's son. He's got other brothers and sisters, younger than Him, uh, half-brothers and sisters. Again, the offspring of Mary and Joseph. Uh, there seems to be general agreement throughout church history that uh, it's sometime during this time that Joseph dies. And, and the the burden of the family falls upon Jesus as the oldest of the siblings. 
Um, there does seem to be uh, some indications that Jesus may have followed in the footsteps of his, uh, uh, his earthly father, Joseph, and taken up carpentry. A lot of his parables uh, lean into that uh, uh, idea of carpentry. I mean, he talks about building houses on uh, rock and building houses on sand, and that was part of the carpentry occupation. And so, uh, But again, increased in wisdom and in stature, most notably in favor with God, of course, God His Father, and humans, people in general. Uh, again, he just he grew up until he was about 30 and then steps onto the grand stage of human history yet again to begin his ministry. And we'll, we'll dive into and look at that more closely beginning next week. I got to be honest, uh, you know, one of the themes that we've been tracing out throughout our excursion from eternity to eternity in all of Scripture is God's glory in salvation through judgment. And I struggled here. Uh, how is God glorified in salvation through judgment in this particular narrative? Well, one theme that Luke accentuates all throughout his gospel is how people are amazed, they marvel at the wonderful works of God and Christ. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 18, verse 47 and 48. Chapter 4, verse 22, verse 32, 36. Chapter 5, verses 9 and 26. Chapter 8, verse 25 and 56. Chapter 11, verse 14. Chapter 20, verse 26, 24, verse 12. These all accentuate how people... They were awed by what they saw. They were astonished. They marveled. Uh, they were amazed. And again, we saw it here, how all who heard Him, verse 47, were amazed at His understanding and His answers. And His parents, when they saw Him, they were astonished as well. Amazed, astonished. Now, there is a connection between people being amazed or astonished at the wonderful works of God and God being glorified. And this is seen in chapter 5 and verse 26 in Luke's Gospel. Amazement seized them all. There it is. Amazement seized them all. And they glorified God. There it is. God is glorified. They were filled with awe. So there it is again. Amazed, awe, and sandwiched between that is the glory of God. God is glorified. Uh, and they were saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. Well, here in 2, verses 47-48, we do have the people being amazed and, and connected to the glorification of God. God is glorified in His Son demonstrating His understanding, demonstrating His uh, relational uh, closeness with His Father. God is glorified in the boy Jesus in His Father's house. So the Son is glorifying the Father in the Father's house, and the people stand amazed at that. And all of this is followed very closely on the heels of that Feast of Passover. Now, stretch way back in your memory recesses to catch hold of, we talked about the Passover many, many moons ago. And how the Passover, that was, that was the great observance, the great uh, feast that reminded the people how they had been delivered from Egyptian bondage. That whole Exodus event when they crossed through the, dry, the, the dried up Red Sea and how God delivered His people from bondage in Egypt. In the process, God was judging not only the Egyptians, but also their gods, especially Pharaoh. Now, one of the other incidents that is unique to Luke is when Jesus is presented in the, in the temple earlier uh, as an infant. And this is Luke 2, verses 22 through 38. And one of the interesting connections, again, keeping in mind, Passover is all about the redemption of the people of God from Egypt. We're told how the prophetess Anna was uh, living at the temple, and uh, while she was there fasting and praying, at the very hour that Jesus is presented in the temple as an infant, she began giving thanks to God, glorifying God, giving thanks to God, and to speak of Him to all who were waiting for, 
Ready? The redemption of Jerusalem. And then here is Jesus and His parents going up during the Feast of Passover, which commemorated the redemption through the Exodus. Later on in Luke's Gospel, you have the account, and it's in Matthew and Mark as well, when Jesus is transfigured. But Luke, Luke very specifically emphasizes how when Moses and Elijah appear with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, they're talking, and Luke specifies they were talking about His departure, but the word that is used there is a word that can also be translated Exodus. They were talking about the new Exodus that Jesus would lead, and of course that culminates in His cross. How He brings redemption to uh, and for His people. So coming back to this account, God is glorified by His Son as He shows up in, the, in His Father's house. The very One who will bring redemption for Jerusalem and indeed for the world. But in that, not only the embodiment of salvation for His people, it would also be God passing judgment upon our sins in His Son on the cross. And I think, maybe just maybe, that's how the glory of God and salvation through judgment shows up even in this particular narrative. So what does it mean for us? Well, not only the redemption that is ours in Christ Jesus, that's a very significant thing as well. We're part of that exodus, that new exodus that Jesus inaugurates in His blood on the cross. But come with me back to verse 49 where you have those words of Jesus he says to his parents, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's things or in my father's affairs? Uh, in my father's house is okay. Uh, the old King James, about my father's business, that's pretty good too. And as I mentioned, already we see Jesus, um, he has a... He has, uh, A sense of His identity. Of who He is in relation to the Father in Heaven. He is my Father. Rather than just our Father, He's my Father. And that's typical for Jesus, especially in John's Gospel, uh, where He emphasizes, you know, go back uh, to the disciples in John chapter 20. Go back uh, to and and tell my disciples that I'm returning to my Father, your Father, my God, your God. Uh, there, There is that clear emphasis here where Jesus identifies my Father in a unique way. It is true that the Father has many sons and daughters. But Jesus is Son in a unique way. A unique Son of the Father. But also, did you not know that I must be about my Father's business? I must. There is a necessity here. Uh, A divine inevitability a divine necessity that Jesus must fulfill the work that has been given to Him by His Father. That that demands His attention first in all things. So I, I must. Uh, the, the, the Son's actions are dictated by His necessity to obey His Father in Heaven. Uh, and that that is quite substantial. That the inclination of the will of Christ was always uh, toward full submission to the will of His Father. Now, granted, He goes and He he is submissive to His parents. He honors His father and His mother. But even then, there does come a point during His ministry where He can no longer be beholden to His parents. Uh, In Mark chapter 3, his family thinks he's gone insane, and they go to seize him, to take hold of him. And that is when Jesus, he, he can't be in, submiss- in submission to uh, his, his mother anymore. And in, in that episode, he says, uh, who is that are my father, my brothers, uh, my mo- who, who are my mother, my brothers, and my sisters? And he looks around at the people that are gathered in the house, standing room only. He says, here are my mother and brothers and sisters, the ones who do the will of my Father. 
And so there in that episode, you see how Christ determines, I must obey my heavenly Father above my earthly family. So that's coming. But in the meantime, we see Him submissive to His parents. What does it mean for us? Well, first, just as Christ had a clear sense of His identity, we too must have a clear idea of our identity. Now, we've discussed before how uh, God is Father to His children. Uh, that it is true that uh, He certainly is kind and good to all of His creatures. And that He relates to every single human as Creator. That every single person is a divine image bearer. But it is to His children specifically that He is Father. To all those who have been born of God, born from above, born again, He is Father to His children. Uh, Sunday mornings, as we go through 1 John, we'll take a closer look at chapter 3, verse 1, but I want to put you in mind of it because it is so closely related to what we're talking about now, about our identity. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. We are, brothers and sisters. We are children of God. What a high and holy privilege that is. Why? Uh, this informs our prayer life. Jesus taught His disciples to pray, Our Father in Heaven. Because He is. And we are His children. And His children have His ear. And we can pray to God as our Father. Again, the emphasis here on our identity. We can call God our Father because we are His children. And since we are His children, as Christ recognized, even at the tender age of 12, the divine necessity that was on His life, so also we, the children of God today, must recognize similarly, the Father, our Father, has placed divine necessity upon each one of us. That He is shaping our lives and bending our wills into conformity with His will. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is a prayer where we are uh, calling upon God even to bend our will into conformity with His will. We want Your will to be done in our lives, Father. I think very often though, maybe I'm the only one, I don't think so. Very often, perhaps too often. More often than we like to admit, right? We are about our own business and our own affairs and our own things rather than the Father's. And as children of the Father, we know there's always that nagging voice in the back of our minds, our conscience, that is saying, yeah, but you know you really ought to be about your Father's business, not your own. We live in that, that tension where we have our things and those things often come heads up with our Father's things. We have our business and it comes into conflict with the Father's business. And it can uh, create some tension in our lives. Uh, perhaps for some of us, maybe even watching online, we have, what is it, too much, too much of the world in us to make Christianity enjoyable, and yet too much Christianity in us to make the world enjoyable. It just leads to a kind of a miserable state for the saint of God. I must be about my Father's business. That's the affirmation. In those moments where we have those two conflicting desires, the affirmation we must make is, I must be about my Father's things. I must be about my Father's business, not my own. What is it Jesus prays in the garden the night before He goes to the cross? Not my will, but Yours be done. That's right in line with, I must be about my Father's business. I must be in 
my Father's things. And similarly, that's a prayer that we too must pray. This is uh, related to what Paul talks about also in, oh, we could pick several passages, but one that comes to mind is Colossians 3. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 5. Where Paul writes there, he says, If then you've been raised with Christ, and, and if there could be since. That's probably the force of it too. Since then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. The things that are above would be our Father's things. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Now those would be our things, right? Uh, for you have died, and your life, is hidden with Christ in God. And so, kind of a double hiding there. But Verse 4, When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Now verse 5, is this is where the rubber meets the road. We put teeth on this thing. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. The old King James says, mortify. As one of the old preachers used to say, mortify, right? Put it to death. One of the uh, Puritans of old wrote a work entitled The Mortification of Sin, John Owen. And I stumbled across this particular section earlier today. Owen wrote, he said, The root of an unmortified course is the digestion of sin without bitterness in the heart. <laughs> People don't write that way anymore, right? <laughs> You're just swallowing sin whole without any indigestion. No bitterness of heart. N none of that contrition where you look upon what you've just done and gone, ah, not again. He says that's the root of an unmortified course. No, it cuts right to the heart. No bitterness of heart. And until sin is bitter, Christ will not be sweet. The salvation that we enjoy will not be fully enjoyed until sin is truly bitter. And we hate it with a holy hatred. Owen goes on, when a man has confirmed his imagination to such an apprehension of grace and mercy as to be able, without bitterness, to swallow and digest daily sins, that man is at the very brink of turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and being hearted by the deceitfulness of sin. And that's... Again, that's where the rubber meets the road. What is grace to us? Is it all y'all income free? I can do whatever I want. And we have time and again the Apostle Paul uh, combating his opponents who were saying that very thing, turning the grace of God into license for sin. God forbid. How can we who have died to sin live in it any longer? How can we turn the grace of God into licentiousness? Well, Owen says one way is just swallowing and digesting those daily sins and never having any bitterness about it. No, in order to be about our Father's things, to be about our Father's business, we must mortify those things that are earthly in us. And what happens over time is more and more, our things become less and less appealing. We don't want them like we used to. And over time, the things of our Father, that becomes our strongest desire. That's what I want. And more and more, that's what I want. And, and there's joy in doing the things of the Father. This is the process of sanctification. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, when you were baptized, yes, you were set apart for service to God, but it wasn't an instant sanctification where, oh, well, I don't have to do anything now. Now we've entered into the realm of the mortification of sin and the sanctification, the process of being set apart more and more for the things of our Father. That's the joy even of divine necessity upon our hearts and upon our minds. The Lord, He's laid hold of us. And where once it was merely possible to be about the Father's business, now it is impossible for me not to 
be doing His will. And indeed, why would I want anything else except to be right in the middle of the things of God, the will of God? And that is more than enough with a sanctified heart. We're nearly out of time. Let us pray about this, and then we'll have final word for the online crowd. We thank You, Father, for Luke. Not just the, as a historian, but that by Your Spirit, You moved him to record this account from the life of our Lord when he was just a boy. And we see from our Lord's life what it means even for us today that we too must be about Your things and Your business and Your affairs. And I pray, Father, that You would fan into flame a great appetite for holy things, an appetite for Your things, and a diminished desire for the things of this world, for our things. And indeed, Father, that those things that belong to our former life, those would become bitterness and that we would spit them out like wormwood and that we would gorge ourselves joyfully on the feast that You've set before us the things that are above. We pray all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen.